This is Anarchast. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. We're here in one of the most dangerous cities on earth, Acapulco, Mexico, according to your propaganda news uh, channel. <laughs> and uh, we're here with Tom McGurk, who's from Port Macquarie, Australia. Uh, how old are you? Uh, 22. 22 years old. Uh, he's been on a little bit of a world tour. He's become an anarchist. And uh, we want to ask him about that. So when, uh, when or how did you become an anarchist? Uh, I don't think there was any eureka moment. I think uh, just slowly research on the internet and it all sort of fell into place. It was, um, I always thought maybe it was an anarchist in my past life because it just, it just seemed so obvious. I think it was when I found out the whole principles of voluntarism, the no initiation of force. You just take that and then you look at any government policy and it's just you know, falls apart. And you think, well then there has to be a better way that's moral and you know, it uh, all works out as well, so economically. So was that like a year ago or two, five years ago that you sort of started thinking about these things? I guess uh, it would have first started with uh, Loose Change 2. Oh, right. So that was, would have been six years ago, maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and I could, instantly I could see the implications of what this meant. And uh, it sort of, you didn't really think about it much beforehand, but then all of a sudden you realise that you know, the state's not your best friend, it's, you know, there's something sinister going on. And, yeah, and I think from there it's just, so many questions after watching that and you go research it and before you know it the snowball starts rolling and you start looking at Ron Paul, the, I was looking at the um, Free State Project quite a bit and uh, yeah, I stumbled across you guys and, you know, yeah. and then you sort of raise you know, anarchism and it was just, I don't know, as a, as a word to what we already are, you, know, so you sort of defined it for me. That's great. Yeah, the uh, loose change, uh, definitely a must-see documentary. Obviously, you're not going to see that on your TV programming from the government at night. Uh, there's, there's definitely a lot of questions about 9-11 that have not been answered at all. And the, uh, the conspiracy theory brought forward by the U.S. government is definitely not uh, the truth. <laughs> it's, um, you can look at all like, the, the physical evidence, but for me, like, it's the the circumstantial evidence and it just it just it doesn't make any sense. No, it makes no sense whatsoever. A couple of guys in caves uh, threw, uh, you know, took over some aircraft with two planes. They knocked down three buildings in New York. <laughs> that was pretty pretty good. Yeah, they, and they they must be good bowlers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they didn't, didn't even hit one and they took over a plane with like box cutters, box cutters, or you know, uh, nail clippers or something <laughs> like. And they can't even fly planes. Although they were actually trained at uh, U.S. Uh, Air Force bases, but yeah, they still yeah. couldn't fly. And uh, and some of them are still alive today, which is odd. Yeah, and then uh, they, they wouldn't they wouldn't uh, investigate it. Took them, I don't know how long it took them, but just they spent, all the families had to get together to, to force them to investigate it. Well, they, they spent more investigating the Monica Lewinsky scandal than 9/11. Yeah, uh, one of the biggest attacks on American <laughs> soil, and you're not going to investigate it. Just going to let it lie. Or? Yeah. And well, they, they, knew, they knew the 12 terrorists, like, you know, <laughs> Well, they found one of the passports from the World Trade Center guy because after the plane hit the building and blew it all up, his passport just kind of fell down and they found it on the sidewalk, so... I think... It must have been him. <laughs> yeah, well, they found, <laughs> they found his passport twice. <laughs> and finally, they, they got their wires mixed there and they... Oh, we found it again. And they, oh, no, we didn't, sorry. Yeah, it's truly unbelievable that some people still don't even know a lot of that stuff. So definitely, if you don't know it, check out uh, the uh, documentary Loose Change. It's about two hours, but it's, it's really, one really one. very, very interesting. And, and I really think that whole 9-11 thing, if we can get more people to realize that it's not what they said it was, that that will really open people up to being more, uh, you know, take the state as for what it is, like a criminal organization, as opposed to something that you should trust. But I think it's the cognitive dissonance of people. Like, I remember watching that, I'd show it to family members, and they sort of watch it, and then at the end of it, It'd just be nothing, you know. It'd just be like, oh, I remember one of my family members. I showed it to him, and I thought it was pretty, pretty big stuff. And he just, oh, I didn't really like the music to it though. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, it's amazing the cognitive dis dissonance of people. And actually, I think it was Hitler who said that, uh, you know, if you're going to tell a lie, make it a really big lie. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what 9-11 is. It's so shocking to people that they yeah. can't even process it. Yeah, it's too hard. And I think um, I'm lucky because I watched it at a young age. But I think if you're, you know, uh, if you're later on, on, on later on in life, it's, uh, it's a scary thing, I think, to radically change your world view. The way you've seen the world last you know, 50 years is right. a lot. And the way that they've indoctrinated you in the uh, day, day prisons for children uh, for 12 years or 16 years with college into this, this mindset and, and they tell you government is good, Roosevelt saved us from the depression, uh, he saved us by uh, going to war, that's how you get out of depressions. And so people quickly learn, if they're open to learning, that's, that all that's wrong. But it's, it's a lot for people to take in, but they're going to learn one way or the other once this all collapses. Yeah, they're going to learn the hard way. Or maybe they won't learn the hard way, they'll just, they'll suffer and then, uh, you know, they'll learn. Well, you've traveled a lot. You've uh, been traveling since you're 18, is that correct? Yeah. And, um, so you've seen a lot of different places. So uh, one thing I always say is, especially to Americans, that not everyone in the world is like Americans, believe me. A lot of people are quite open-minded and a lot of people are actually very anarchist by nature. A lot of people here in Mexico are just naturally anarchist. Um, have you seen any, any of that sort of thing? Yeah, it seems like a small thing, but for me it was really exciting. Um, we're walking back uh, from a restaurant with um, some Mexican people I met. And um, they just walked past this ute and they said, I'll hop in. The ute's like a pickup truck. And uh, back in Australia, I'm sure in the States as well, you, you're not allowed to sit in the back of the ute. Like, that's a big no-no. You, know, you have to be in the car with a seatbelt on and then your helmet on. <laughs> but here, you just you jump in the back of the ute and off you go. And it's so practical. and it, seemed, it was such a small thing, but um, for me, it was a big thing. It was like such a small thing, such a small amount of freedom was so enjoyable for me. Yeah, and I see that all the time down here, and actually living free is so much st less stressful, and it's so much nicer, and th this whole system they have in the West of, and they say it's for your own protection, uh, that you have to do everything. So you see a cop, I, as one example, I just saw a private security guard where, where I live, we just drove by him, and I realized that I waved at him and I smiled, and he, he's almost dressed up like a police officer, but he's a private security guard. Now, I would never wave and smile at a cop. Uh, you know, the cops are really, uh, especially in the West, they're just the oppressors. And uh, if we could just privatize that, it would be such a much better world. Uh, you never hear about security guard uh, brutality, you know. <laughs> um, but once you put it in the hands of the collective and once you uh, give them free reign and a monopoly, uh, all monopolies always turn into just mm. horribleness. And that was, that was actually, um looking into travel insurance and I was looking at the, uh, the sales wrap for one of the top travel insurers back in Australia and uh, the service they provide, outstanding, there's, there's no state uh, emergency service that could beat them. You know, if, you, if you break your foot in the middle of Amazon, they'll send in a medivac uh, four-wheel drive to take you out, the medivac you to a world-class hospital anywhere in the world and, and it's like the cost of it is like a couple hundred dollars for about three months. And, uh, I was just thinking, looking at that, and why can't we privatize that? Why can't we privatize security? Everything could be privatized and they'll just run like a well oiled machine. Because they'd have to, otherwise, you know, they won't survive. Right. Uh, yeah, they'll get fired. Um, so, you've been in Acapulco for a few weeks now, I believe. Yeah, it's come up to a month soon, I think. Yeah. Okay. How have you been enjoying it? I've really enjoyed it, yeah. Um, I remember you said before, you, you can never know a place till you get here. So, I didn't really know what, what to expect. But um, it's been really good, uh, plenty of sun. I'm still sort of in holiday mode, just going to the beach every second day and just meeting people and going out, getting a feel for the city. But um, it's, uh, everything's paced slower and um, you, you don't feel like every time, like back in Australia, every time you go out, everyone's in a rush and you know, all the bars close early. If you're not there like at a certain time, you're not getting in. You know, every t every time you approach a club, you have to like act sober. Everyone acts sober, <laughs> and show your identification. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And you told me a story about that. How uh, what you did in Australia with your ID when you were underage. Mm. Well, yeah. Um, a lot of these guys. He wasn't for the state, but similar to a lot of state workers. Well, they're forced by the state to do all those exactly, things. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, I used to go into bars, 
not with a fake ID, but with my actual ID when I was 17. And they just couldn't work out the numbers of when I was meant to be 18. So, like 80% of the time, I'd get into any club, any bar I wanted to, just on my, on my ID when I was 17. That's one of the great things is that most people who work for the government or w who work for things that are actually backed, you know, they're forced to do things by the government, they're usually not your brightest people. So we can still worm our way by and, mm. and try to be semi-free still. Mm. That's the, the, the one good thing about the state is the inefficiency. Yeah, Doug Casey says uh, if you want to live somewhere and they have a really strong state, uh, you know, a very all-encompassing state, you want it to be as inefficient as mm. possible. So today in the U.S., you've got the worst of both worlds. They're the most, one of the most, uh, they are the most efficient government in terms of surveillance, taxation. Uh, they'll find you anywhere in the world if you don't pay them their uh, extortion fees. Uh, but at the same time, the people who work for them aren't necessarily the brightest people either. The, like, who, who wants to work for government? Who, who's a kid and he goes, I yeah, want to work yeah. for the IRS. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, you can still find your ways around, but it's getting harder and harder. And I really tell people to, uh, you know, if you live in the U.S. now, uh, or anywhere in the Western world, Canada, Australia, Europe, um, really uh, prepare yourself. There's going to be a lot of changes. Uh, if you have the opportunity to get another passport, if you have the opp opportunity, go somewhere else. Uh, there's so much more opportunity in uh, Latin America, in Asia. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that from your, your travels. Well, uh, I haven't been anywhere else in Latin America yet, but uh, I think one of my goals at the moment is to learn Spanish. I think that's a very big uh, investment. This opens up this entire continent. And uh, I think uh, English soon won't be as prominent as it is. I think you can't get by with English soon. Yeah, I recommend to uh, people, and I don't. I rec definitely recommend you don't put them in the child indoctrination centers, but uh, for example, my eight-year-old son speaks fluent German, fluent Spanish, and he's learning English right now. And he, he actually wants to learn Chinese, and he's eight years old. It's all pretty much self-taught. Uh, he just learned it from watching movies and, and talking to people. And uh, so, yeah, there's, there's so many different ways to live and, and definitely having some of these languages. And Spanish is really important, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, people go, oh, we need to educate our children. Well, there's really not a lot to teach them except for how to speak, uh, how to read and write, and a little bit of math. And even the math, the math is they're forced to learn. You can do it all on a calculator, on a yeah. computer. It's really useless to waste your time learning that yeah. stuff. Unless you want to be, if your son says, I want to be a mathematician. Okay, well, learn it all. That's great. But if he doesn't want to learn that, there's no point in teaching him. I mean, the future education, uh, education now is so uh, stuck 100 years ago. Like, uh, you could learn top of the line math on YouTube. You know, you can oh, learn any language. The Khan Academy is excellent. Yeah, you can learn anything online. If you really want to learn something, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to learn online. It's free, usually. So. Well, we're running out of time. I have uh, places to go, things to do. Uh, but a real pleasure to talk to you, Tom. As well. Too. All right. That's Anarchast, your home for anarchy on the internet. Peace, love, and anarchy.